Investor's Guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. What we do on this show basically is spend half an hour every week focusing on our money. And that's great advice really if you just take it as that much. While you spend the whole week earning your money, it's important to give it at least half an hour a week to make sure your money is managed well, that it's invested in the right investments, and that it's earning while you're in the office. This week, over the next half hour, we'll help a retired investor plan his finances. In our product review, we look at the Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip, and we'll help investors pick out the right asset classes. Let me bring in Virendra Kumar. Virendra, thank you so much for joining us on Investor's Guide, as always. Let's take a look first at the profile of the financial plan that we're looking at. A 28-year-old, no loans, no liabilities, also no term insurance and no health insurance. His goal is to build a corpus for the long term. Now, if we take a look at this, and I want to first just put aside advice for 28-year-olds, and this is where we all start off from. Normally, Indians start around the age 27, 28 when they start investing. So no liabilities, which is fantastic, but at the same time, no insurance. So fixing the insurance portion will be the first thing he needs to do? Yes, absolutely. You know, there is a very simple uh, hierarchy of your, you know, uh, setting your priority in personal finance. Uh, get your insurance if you have dependents. Of course, you don't need life insurance if you have no financial dependents. Then comes health insurance for yourself, definitely. And just check, you know, if your employer provides it or you are, you should have adequate. And uh, don't get uh, carried for, you know, having a very elaborate uh, health insurance in a manner that it's very expensive. Just look at the cost benefit and the state of your health. Uh, because uh, the whole idea of health insurance is to protect yourself from ensuring that your investment plan do not get derailed uh, if you get unwell or somebody in your family uh, is unwell. So in that sense, uh, a big uh, medical expense, that has to be re re really covered. And then comes getting methodically about your investments. Uh, money which you are likely to need in four, five years should be invested conservatively. And uh, the money which you are unlikely to need for five years and more, then you actually choose one of our plan and get methodical about it and you know factor in your tax status, how much you need to save for savings, you know, how much you need to invest to save taxes. And so there's a very clear roadmap. So definitely these two things top on anybody's priority. So it's very clear, of course, and while Virinda said it's important to have life insurance if you have dependents, Sujit VK, who is our 28-year-old who's written in, you might not have dependents today, but you will in the future. So it does make sense to get started on a life insurance policy or a term insurance policy while you're young because it's a lot cheaper at your age and it becomes more and more expensive as you get older. Now he wants to invest for the next seven to 10 years. He doesn't have a specific goal. He just wants to start putting away money. Here are his details, five lakh rupees in a savings account that could function nicely as an emergency fund. He also has 30,000 rupees invested in the national savings certificate which will mature next year. That's all he has so far. He doesn't have any other investment. He says he can put aside 20 to 25,000 rupees from his savings every month into mutual funds and ideally to save on tax. Uh, he does have a couple of mutual funds going. There's an SIP of 1,500 rupees in the Franklin India Hydro's companies. And he had an SBI dynamic bond fund that he closed a month ago. Now, he wants to know how he should get started. Now, let's assume we use the fixed deposit as an emergency fund. He buys health insurance for himself and his family, and he buys a rudimentary term insurance plan. Post that, what is the next step to do for someone who wants to save tax? The straight choice is that, uh, you know, one and a half lakh rupees minus your provident fund contribution should find its way into a tax saving fund. And rest of it, uh, given your investment time frame, uh, you should consider one of our portfolio, maybe a growth portfolio, not the aggressive growth portfolio, even though you are 28, but you have been very reluctant, you have built a high huge emergency fund. Also revisit your emergency fund. I think you know that is the, all your accumulation so far. Five lakh rupees too larger, we are, unless you visualize some emergency which can just, you know, uh, but uh, I think it should be uh, it, this much of over preparedness. This is, there is an opportunity loss and more so for somebody who's 28 year old will have a long term, you know, long time. Uh, if, even if you're able to retain one, one and a half lakh rupees or two lakh rupees as, a, as the emergency fund, which will be accessible anytime, remaining money, there will be opportunity loss, three lakh rupees invested today methodically. 
uh, over and above the 20 to 25,000 rupees which you will be saving in every month. If you spread that 3 lakh rupees over the next 12 months which will translate into a 25,000 rupees monthly contribution in one of our portfolio, that will translate into something more very sizable 15, 20 years down the line. Well, also, Narendra, if, if his fundamental uh, aim right now is to save on tax, which he will do as soon as he buys a health insurance plan and a term insurance plan, uh, could he then also start off with two conservative tax saver mutual funds and then upgrade perhaps to the growth portfolio over a period of time? No, a simple, simpler way will be, you know, he should just calculate how much money he needs to save for, uh, you know, invest to save in a tax saving fund to save taxes. And he should just substitute one of our, you know, equity fund from his growth portfolio uh, and contribute uh, to that extent in that tax saving fund and remaining money should be um, as per that allocation of the growth portfolio. So that's, that's not a very difficult thing to do. Substituting one of the multicast funds with the tax saving funds and increasing the amount to the extent he can save taxes should, will do the job. All right, so our uh, tax saver funds are on your screen as well as our growth portfolio. Someone from my team will get in touch and will send you that entire list. Thank you for reaching out to us. If you're watching at home, do you want advice on how and when to save your money? Write to us. Our email ID is at the bottom of your screen. Ram Babu has written in the news. He says he gets 30 lakh rupees as a lump sum and a pension of 60,000 rupees per month post retirement. He's already covered under the central government's health scheme. He wants to know which mutual fund he should be investing in for a one time investment. Now, assuming that his monthly requirements are taken care of, and we're just looking at that 30 lakh rupee lump sum he should be investing in. What kind of an investment would you recommend for Ram Babu? Two important things. One is that uh, the, he should be investing in our stable growth portfolio. He should be choosing one or two balanced funds. And he should ensure that uh, the reason is uh, very straightforward. The money, the return that he will derive from this balanced fund will be tax free if held for over one year. So he will not have any tax headache. He will not have to pay taxes. That apart, this in retirement, you are. Uh, ability to withstand big declines in value of your capital goes down or you get unnerved by, uh, you know, uh, by that. So that you will be relatively, you know, you, it will not be a pure equity portfolio which will, which will crumble in a market decline, which, which might be very disappointing for somebody in retirement. That part, I think, you know, another important thing which you should keep in mind that he should not invest his 30 lakh rupee at one go at any cost. If at all he has to do that, then he should be investing in fixed income. He has no problem investing in, but all the money that he will derive from senior citizen savings scheme or a fixed income fund or a FMP or a bond will be entirely taxable or making a deposit in the bank. It will all be taxable. So that, that is best avoidable simply because he, if he is willing to assume that risk and more so if he given his status that his income is completely taken care of, to, to mitigate the risk of lump sum investment, you know, at the market risk, he, he should ensure that this 30 lakh rupees has taken a lifetime to accumulate. So his risk tolerance or, or his ability to withstand the market exposure will be very low. So he should be very uh, strict about you know, ensuring that his money is spread over a long period of time, almost like a full market cycle. My understanding is that uh, he, shouldn't, he shouldn't be taking many years, but at least three to four years should be the time period in which he should be spreading his investment in, in the set of balanced funds. Uh, to reduce the risk of, or you know, or substantially reduce the risk of, you know, catching a market high. All right. So remember, it doesn't matter what age you are at. Investing a lump sum amount in the in the market through mutual funds is always a bad idea because you run the risk of either catching a high or catching a low, and losing a lot more money. It makes sense to spread out any lump sum investment over the course of six months to at least a couple of years. Virendra Kumar is still with us. And this week we're looking at the Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip Fund. We've got a question about this fund, Virendra, and I want to address the question before we get into the details of the fund. Sharon MS has written, now she says her husband started investing in the Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip Fund direct plan in May. And this question is coming in because we talked about direct plans last week and the fact that there is a possibility of earning more money through a direct plan. Now, she said it's his first fund, so he did his KYC through the fund. Now, the first two months, the deductions came in, and after that, the deductions stopped. Several visits to the regional office, and they've not been able to solve the problem yet. She wants to know, should they re-register for an SIP? What is the problem with the direct option right now? And what should they do next? 
I really don't have a sense of the kind of problem which investors face of this kind. These are operational issues. It has nothing to do with the performance of the fund. Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip Fund is an outstanding fund. It is very much a part of our you know, growth portfolio, our aggressive growth portfolio. And uh, uh, these are, and this is the kind of problem which actually happens once in a while with most fund companies. Because if you look at the underlying service providers, uh, most mutual fund companies are served by two registrar companies. And uh, they take care of all this, uh, the mechanics, the operational dimensions or uh, aspects of it. Taking your application form, doing your KYC, taking your application form, processing it, paying you the dividend, sending you the account statement, providing you the online services, and uh, ensuring SIP registration, ensuring SWP registration or systematic transfer plan. And mutual funds have been, you know, uh, to simplify investor life, some of these features. Uh, many a times mutual funds provide user services and complicate things. But my understanding is that SIP, SWP, and SCP is a very useful feature. But it is filled with complications because uh, the number of people involved in uh, effectively, uh, you know, implementing this because when you, uh, the money moves from your bank to the fund company at defined periodicity over a period of time and uh, there are different people and, and then the registrar and transfer agency has to be aware of it. So there is a possibility. I'm not saying that, you know, but these are problems which mutual funds can actually eradicate completely by a superior or proactive service and Mirai might have, Mirai Asset might be less proactive on that. There are fund companies with uh, very high, you know, a different um, uh, superior uh, uh, customer service or ability to solve customers' problem of this kind. Uh, but this kind of problem can happen with any fund company because uh, the underlying backend of ser providing service to investor is the same. Uh, Mirai is, no, 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 is not unique. Then comes, you know, whether it's a good fund, we get this problem fixed. It's a one-time problem. I, do, I haven't come across too many problems of this kind. And once it gets going, it will be on for many, many years. Renewing it is not a problem. Re withdrawing your money or, you know, redeeming your investment is not a complicated thing because mutual funds are fairly safe from that, you know, despite these operational glitches. Uh, your money, uh, you can invest only from your bank account and the money can get back only in, your, in the investor's bank account. Nobody else can invest for you and nobody else can get your money back. So in the, in the, the, the primary safety of your money is ensured. Uh, Sharon, the thing you should remember is that while the direct plan is new to us, it's also new to the industry. So there might be a few hiccups along the way. Uh, what you should do is get in touch with the company, maybe restart your SIP. Um, that might be a good way to do it. If you need any more help, of course, you can get in touch with us. But let's take a look at the fund in question, the Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip. Avant will take you through the latest numbers, Avant. Thanks, Faye. This week, we take a look at the Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip Fund. With a five-star rating on value research, this fund has had a stellar performance over the long term. A closer look at the fund's performance over the last five years shows that the fund has had good returns in the bear and the bull phases of the market. In fact, the fund has not only seen good returns over the long term, but in the last one year, it has a return of 25%. Interestingly, you'll say that the fund performs better than most of the other mid-cap funds with a three-year return of 47%. So is this fund a must-have in your portfolio? Let's find out. With that, it's back to you, Faye. All right, Avan, thank you for those numbers. Dhenendra, uh, you just said it's an outstanding fund, five stars in value research, 24% uh, annualized uh, CAGR return since it launched, and it's been very strong. 22% over the last one year is an extremely impressive return. Uh, would you recommend that this, like Shirin told us, is her husband's first fund? Should this be an anchor fund in some portfolio? No. I, in fact, that is one more piece of uh, thing which I actually missed on in, uh, in telling her, that uh, this is a great fund, but this is not the kind of fund which should be your first investment. Of course, we have already hit a problem uh, uh, on the service front, uh, and this can be further disappointing, though this is a great mid-cap fund. Uh, but it is not a, it's not the kind of fund which you should start with. You know, ideally somebody like you who has never experienced a, the market should start with a balanced fund because this, though this is an outstanding fund, it is not the kind of fund which one, an investor should be starting his investments with. So then if it's not a first-timer who should use this fund, what kind of investor should be using this fund? 
Uh, you know, it finds a very prominent place. It is one of the, you know, it has a 20% allocation in our aggressive growth portfolio. And investors looking at superlative returns from his equity investment should be investing in this fund. Regular investment will only optimize the return. This fund has been extraordinarily impressive. Uh, and it has a very broad mandate. It ha and I can say that, you know, right now, given its age, it has been through a full market cycle. Uh, it has demonstrated its ability, you know, and by its selectivity, by building a portfolio whereby, you know, it, it is the least volatile um, mid-cap fund. It has a very broad mandate. It can invest in, it, it must invest, it should not be investing in the top 100 companies by capitalization. And it should not, uh, you know, and it avoids investing in companies with capitalization of 100 crore. So given this scale, you know, that ignoring companies which are, uh, which have capitalization of 100 crore, and avoiding the top 100, and it's not supposed to be investing in the top 100 companies. Your investment universe is very large, and uh, it has been very selective. You know, 35, 40 stocks uh, over time, and uh, been always been right with you know its top bets. Uh, very prudently, you know, moving. In. It's a very active portfolio, and uh, uh, it, it and it has been able to navigate you know or manage the portfolio risk substantially. Uh, it is the least volatile among the mid-cap fund and the best, you know, best reward that we have seen from a mid-cap fund. And uh, the, the management continues. And uh, so I, very thoughtful fund management uh, through the full market cycle and it came from nowhere to establish a name for itself as a prominent one. All right. Uh, then finally, your star rating for the Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip, where would you place it? Uh, just as, uh, you know, where it gets stacked as on the risk adjusted scale, which is a five star and going by, you know, the combination of the risk and the return grade, uh, it looks like, uh, it's likely to prevail, remain there for a long time, a five star. All right. Five stars there for the Mirai Asset Emerging Blue Chip. While it's a fantastic, outstanding fund and five stars are difficult to come by on this show, it's not for first timers. So if you're a first time investor, you should go with something a little more conservative. 35 year old Rohan is written in in part of our hold or sell segment. He does as he and his wife are planning to have their first child and he wants to create a corpus of one crore rupees over the next five years. He can invest 30 to 40,000 rupees a month for five years. And he's already invested 5 lakh rupees in the funds that he's going to have listed. Is that a fair expectation in terms of return? There is a 40,000 rupees a month compounding to five, 1 crore rupees in 5 years? No, it's not an unreasonable return because, you know, if you look at his own contribution, 5 lakh he already has, the next 10 years he is going to invest 5 lakh rupees a month. His own contribution to this, uh, to his investment plan will be about 50 lakh rupees. Uh, so I don't think it's an unreasonable thing. Uh, but you know, real life actually works differently. Uh, he will he will be witnessing you know uh, he will uh, he will have larger income. His his income will grow, and he should work towards you know uh, and he should ensure that he's investing more as his income rises, and uh, he should be more realistic about you know he should ensure that he's investing all the surplus that he has and that investment if it rises over over here, he he could well land up with that. I think the biggest problem with his that. Uh, target of one crore is that the target that one crore will not be a meaningful sum 10 years from now. Uh, it will not have the same value. In fact, many of his uh, needs, the kind of uh, thing he will be aspiring for, many of those uh, expenses will be of, will require far more money. So he should ensure that he's investing as much as he can and he should ensure that he's inv definitely increasing his investment as his income rises. And that's all that he has in his uh, control. But well, David, let's look at the funds he has in his portfolio. And this is an interesting portfolio. He seems to be very fond of the HDFC fund house because he has HDFC equity, HDFC top 200, the HDFC tax saver, and 80% of his contribution goes into these three funds. Now, other than that, he has the IDFC premier equity growth and the reliance growth plan along with the SBI Magnum tax gain. These are the funds that he has in his portfolio. So. Let's talk first about the fact that 80% of his contribution right now is going into funds of one fund house. What kind of risk does that give him? Uh, at a certain level, it is a risk, and right now this risk is far more visible because if you look at the struggle of the HDFC fund and particularly these three funds, it, they, these funds have been relatively disappointing. Uh, we have seen the whole runaway of the market, and uh, these funds actually took time to catch up. Uh, now they're catching up, but you know this is not a sensible thing. There are, the, the reason why you invest in a mutual fund 
is the reason why you should not invest a substantial part of your money if you have a sizable money going into a mutual fund. Uh, a, a, most of it should not be in a single fund. Uh, you should be able to, and you know, all this, all your accumulation over time will translate into something substantial. And 80% of your thing cannot be really tied to uh, the brilliance or the luck or the bad luck of a single fund manager. So in that sense, that is a risk. The reason why you invest in a mutual fund is the reason why you should invest in more than one mutual fund. And of course, it should not be too many mutual funds, otherwise you lose the benefit of mutual funds. Uh, so it's a very fine balance. Have no more than four or five funds. And uh, if you look at one of our portfolio, you know, the growth portfolio or the aggressive growth portfolio, we have been able to achieve that by spreading your money and ensuring that you don't have 20% of your money in a single fund exposure. Uh, uh, and this should be a, I th and I think this is a very useful rule, not having more than 25% in a single fund if you are looking at accumulating, even if you are investing 20,000 rupees a month, uh, that money will accumulate over a, into a large sum over a period of time. Make sure that none of your fund is increased, has more, you know, you have more than 25% exposure. Uh, but at, at a very basic level, you can moderate your risk or you can reduce your risk substantially by making sure uh, having these checks and balances in place, not having more than 25% in a single fund. And maybe for him, I can re strongly recommend our growth portfolio. All right. Not more than 25% in any single fund, and don't tilt so heavily into one fund house, because like we're seeing right now, if that fund house makes a couple of bad decisions, then all of your or 80% of your portfolio has to suffer, or at least wait until those bad decisions are, uh, you know, recover. So Virendra is recommending our growth portfolio, which is on your screen right now. You can write that down, and someone from my team will get in touch with you. Karthik Zavedi has been kind enough to answer questions that we have on asset allocation. Karthik, you know Kumar has written in. He wants to invest 25,000 rupees a month over the next 5 to 10 years. He wants to know how he should go about picking funds. So fundamentally, the question he's asking is asset classes. If he should be investing all of the money in equity, and how he should decide how much of it should go into equity. Okay, so firstly, if you're going to start an SIP, you don't want to start it with a time frame of five years. Basically, you need to expand your horizon a little bit more. The reason for that is each installment that goes inside an SIP must be held for an average period of four to seven years. That's typically the time frame we must hold any stock market investment. So with an SIP, your time frame pretty much doubles to eight to 10 years or even 12 years. So therefore, you need to be there for a longer period. The kind of funds that you can choose is you look at putting about 40% of your money into diversified large cap kind of funds and about 30% each into a mid-cap and a sectoral kind of fund. You can expect to accumulate close to about 65 lakhs in the next 10 years if you go ahead with this 25,000 a month. 32-year-old Yuvraj has also written in. He wants to invest a lump sum amount through the direct route in equity diversified funds for the next 15 years. He wants to invest in two debt funds and then transfer the money to equity funds through the STP route over 12 months. Now, what is the tax implication if he uses the STP route? It definitely makes sense to use an STP instead of putting all of that money in, in a lump sum. But Karthik, how much tax is he going to have to pay? Okay, so, you know, using the STP route to get into equity funds is a great idea. But at the current state of affairs, I do not think that 12 months is a very wise thing to do. You may want to consider expanding that time frame a little bit. The other thing to understand is that whenever you will be moving out funds from this debt fund to the equity fund, for each installment that you move out, there will be a little bit of capital gain. Now that capital gain will be on a short term basis, obviously, because you're selling it much before the long term period. Because of you moving out of the debt fund, that money that you make will get added to your income. Because it gets added to your income, whichever tax bracket you fall under, you will be taxed according to your slab, which is 20% or 30% as the case may be. I think thank you so much for answering those questions. Remember, if you're at home right now and you want help with your money, especially if you think that you haven't gotten started and you don't know where to start, well, just write to us. Our email ID is at the bottom of your screen. So is my Twitter handle. Get in touch directly. It will be my pleasure to hear from you. I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for watching. <laughs>